Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today's guest is Mina Chitinkaya Rondell. She's a faculty member at Duke and an advocate for open access education. She's co authored three books that are open in statistics. And um, I've just really enjoyed uh, reading a lot of her work. One of the first things I noticed about Mina was that, like me um, previously, she was straddling the Edinburgh to Research Triangle Park uh, jump, which I thought was interesting. And then when I saw the cool work she's doing in uh, open access education, I've been looking forward to having her on the show for a while. So um, to begin, Mina, welcome to the show. Thank and, you. And uh, maybe we should just hop into it with, um, we'll talk about statistical teaching a bit, and then we'll figure out, um, once once we have a grasp of that, we'll go into a little bit more of the open access education, because I think that um, that's really interesting. I, I can't, I always think back to my last year in undergrad when um, I had to buy um, my numerical analysis textbook. It was maybe 150 pages. It cost me 150 bucks. And the thing was just in tatters. Like it, it looked like it came out of a shipwreck. Um, it was falling apart on me. And I thought it's like, you know what, this is a real scam. Um, so when I see a lot of this open access education, especially what's available on the internet and knowing from my own experiences, where I got the most learning, which tends to be on online resources and monographs created by experts that are just out there for free. Um, I thought that was uh, very, that that is very strongly shaped my opinion on these things. But anyway, uh, so I guess the first thing is, you know, um, there's a lot of chatter on what should be taught in statistics and there's a, what should be taught for statisticians versus data scientists. Um, but I've also seen a lot of chatter where everyone just says what needs to be added and they don't consider the opportunity cost about what needs to be taken out in order to make room for what needs to be added. So, um, when do you, do you agree with that? Does it seem like everyone has a wish list? It's, you know, if you, if you add things and you aren't telling what has to be removed, you aren't providing a strategy. You're just providing a, a wish list of what uh, people should know. Um, so are there high priority topics that we should be adding, um, and what needs to come out or what are the lower priority things that need to come out? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you that we often talk about what are we missing in our curricula um, so that we can add those things in. But um, when it comes to implementation, you need to make room for them because the semester length or quarter length isn't going up. Right. And we can't just keep demanding from our students and, you know, adding topics and then glossing over them because you, you need to get through them quickly. I don't know that that's actually any better than not mentioning those topics at all. It can in fact have a, like a backfiring effect of frustrate students mm -hmm. in a way. Um, you know, we can't just say, hey, let's add computing to this course, but we won't teach it to you at all. You'll just have to figure it out yourself. And I think what you're gonna end up with is a classroom full of students who say, I don't like computing because I've not actually learned it. So um, I think the, the thing is, you know, obviously there's stuff in our curricula that's there because we believe they're important. Um, but I think I often try to think about how do we reorder things or how do we kind of um, repeat certain things across courses, uh, across a curriculum, um, but then certain things we just like make sure they're covered once and then we don't like harp on them so much. And then my specialty is uh, primarily introductory education which means that I often teach students who both might do a lot more statistics. So I can think of them as, well, I don't have to teach them everything this semester because they're gonna take the second and the third and the fourth course. But also there's probably a good chunk of those students in that large introductory classroom, whether that's intro stat or intro data science, for whom this is the only class they're taking. So we also need to think about if this is the only class they're taking, what should they see? And in my opinion, um, one of the things that, um, you know, that comes up as can we cut down on is statistical inference. But this is not to say statistical inference isn't important. I mean, the notion of uncertainty is so difficult for uh, humans to understand. Um, quantifying uncertainty is really difficult. And there's no one better suited on earth to teach this stuff than, you know, trained statisticians. So, um, I often am thinking about how do we reduce um, statistical inference in our introductory courses to make room for some of the other um, kind of concepts and topics that we believe need to be there, particularly for students for whom this may be their only stats course. Um, 
But that's not to say we shouldn't teach them about statistical inference. It's more to say, you know, maybe we don't need to spend like 20 minutes of class time talking about how to hand calculate different standard errors. Um, there's, you know, if you look at very traditional interstat curricula or maybe even AP statistics curriculum, um, there's a lot of stuff about should we pull the proportions? Should we pull the means? And what does that mean for the calc for the formula we need to hand calculate? Or can we work through an ANOVA table by hand? Um, you can't teach this stuff without taking some significant amount of time. Because, you know, there's just like a lot of steps to doing them mm -hmm. and teaching them. But then just saying, let the computer do it. Don't worry yourself about what it's doing. I don't think it's doing a whole lot of service as well. So. I would say that one of the that it, it in fact I agree that yeah we keep talking about what to add but I think lots of us are also thinking about what to either subtract restructure or reorder so that we make room for some of these things like adding more computing adding reproducibility adding working with messy data to our intro courses has to come at a cost of losing some content and I think a uh, low hanging fruit is some of these manual calculations around statistical inference topics so we can keep inference in there but not have students um you know work through the nitty-gritty of things especially in a class where we're not actually teaching them the theory a lot of interest stock courses tend to you know in a way tell students trust me the central limit theorem is correct because they're not there to like prove it yet uh so we do try to simulate it and stuff and leave it there so i think some of that stuff can be reduced the manual calculations to gain some time and some of it can just be left to a second or a third course where the students will have had the um, mathematical background, you know, uh, up to date by that by the time they're taking, say, a mathematical statistics course and they can get to see that again. So I like statistical inference. I mean, <laughs> it's a huge portion of what we do as statisticians. I think it should it will be a huge disservice to our students to not talk about it at all. But I think we have ways of talking about it without spending so much time on it. And the latest book that I've worked on with Joe Harden, The Introduction to Modern Statistics, is a book designed for an introductory statistics course. And you know, we'd really try to take that approach um, to heart to highlight the computational approaches like bootstrapping and randomization and kind of reiterate whatever you're setting, whether you're working with means or proportions or medians or whatever, the um, computational processes will be the same. So hopefully we gain some time with from each unit of describing a new test because we say, well, we're just going to do the same thing we learned in the previous unit. And with that time that we gain, we're able to do a little bit more on working with real data, working with messy data, computing, and also modeling, multivariable thinking. I mean, those are really things I think lots of us agree need to be there in the curriculum. And yeah, like we need to take some stuff out. Otherwise, we're going to lose all the students because they'll get frustrated. Hey, everyone. We're a few minutes into the episode, and this is usually the time for a commercial break. I don't have commercials, but I will ask two things for you. First, if you could leave a like or dislike to the video, depending on your preference. And secondly, if you leave a comment in the description. If you don't quite know what you would like to say in the comments, just let me know what you think about the episode so far. The reason that I'm really fascinated in Mina's work is because, like, as a podcaster, I'm interested in having a access to a large number of conversations, a large number of ideas. I feel as like Mina is also pushing that space forward and giving students and early career learners access to as much information as is possible. So that's why I was interested. If you'd like more episodes on open access education, specifically with regard to statistics and data science, just let me know in the comments below. If you don't, just let me know in the comments below. Thanks, and back to the show. Do you think some of the reason why uh, these, uh, for example, maybe the AP statistics curriculum really focuses on some of these hand calculations and things like that is because effectively the AP is for a test and effectively that we are structuring our teaching around something for which we can then subsequently test the students. Um, so effectively, part of what we're doing is like, we, we have to teach them something such a, for, for which we can test them later. And unfortunately, a lot of actual practical applied statistics isn't something that you can you know, formally present someone with a test. It's more just like you throw someone into the muck and you see what they come out with. Um, what are, what are yeah. your thoughts on that? Um, I think that, it, I think more so than, 
so that we can test them. I think so that we can test them without a computer around, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I've been involved. Which is even worse, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so too. So I've been involved with the AP statistics curriculum and, you know, oftentimes as like university faculty, we do tend to like think it has a bad rep because it, it does a little bit, but also some really fantastic thinking honestly goes into the structuring of those AP uh like statistics test questions in terms of how like the like i was on the test development committee and i like i actually was involved with some of the discussions of like how do we write these questions and i think a lot of that conversation is like incredibly valuable it was so nice to hear the high school teachers who actually teach this material their perspective on what they believe the students will be able to kind of figure out how we can push them in new ways of thinking and stuff like that. But then ultimately, when you put this stuff in a format where the only way students can express the correct answers is with a pen or a pencil on paper, and there needs to be some very standardized grading for it, you know, we, they end up fitting back into these molds that look not like how real statisticians, you know, work with data. So I think a part of it may be testing, but I think a big part of it is also testing without a computer around which basically means that they're not going to be working with the messy data as it comes it has to be a smallish you know uh easy to work by hand and oftentimes looking only at bivariate relationships because those are the ones where the formula where you can kind of do things with formulas without talking about matrices and stuff mm, then that ends up being somewhat of a dry curriculum i mean there are maybe some questions that might be really interesting that can be answered with a two mean test, but not a whole lot, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then the other way of bringing in multiple variables ends up being, here's a regression output of a multivariable regression, read it. You know, that's not that exciting either. I don't think we've added so much value to it mm -hmm. by simply showing them computer output. I think lots of the exciting stuff is what happens in between when you get the data and when you get to that uh, final computing output. So I think if we can just have the students interact with the data um, using a computer, this could be a scripting language, you know, something like R, which would be what I would advocate, but it could also be a drag and drop thing, something, but something where they get to try things out along the way, as opposed to just look at a static output. Um, I think that's that would be the way to go about kind of teaching more of the statistical thinking as opposed to how to read statistical output or how to calculate statistical output. Um, unfortunately, a thing that I hear very regularly, whether this be at the high school level or at the university level, is things like, well, we our students don't always have access to a computer. And, you know, I think that's like a really big problem that needs to be addressed perhaps at the policy level, but like the cynic in me sometimes asks, well, they're able to take computer science AP classes where they do things on the computer. So I really think that, yes, I think resources are an issue, but also um, kind of this perception of you can do statistics without computing is something so ingrained that it ends up driving the topics because then the topics we teach students ends up being things you can do without computing and by hand calculation. So I think that's what tends to drive a lot of curricula. Um, and, you know, it's just I, lots of places this is changing and I'd like to see that change happen more quickly. Um, even going down to lower levels of say the high school and not just at the university level. So, yeah, that's interesting. Cause so would you, would it be correct to say that uh, for an, an educational outsider like myself, that there's a large amount of sort of uh, pedagogical vibrancy that we don't see because it's effectively filtered or bottlenecked through something like the AP exam. So effectively people are having a large number of very good ideas and there's a lot of great conversations happening. Um, but for someone like me, who's on the outside, what I'm only seeing is effectively, ultimately students being geared towards a test. Um, so there might be a lot more going on than we can appreciate. Um, yeah, they're being geared towards a test and I guess, you know, standardized tests are no, you know, they're not the 
sexiest thing out there, but they exist for a particular reason and they serve huge numbers of students in a way non-standardized tests maybe couldn't. Um, but it's the structure, the spirit of that test of like being having to do it on paper, mm -hmm. I think is what ends up structuring a lot of high school curricula. And this is similarly true for um, university curricula as well. I mean, um, you know, we have faculty at, you know, many universities and two-year colleges who are teaching statistics, maybe without a computing lab component attached, because that's just not have been part of the resource allocation for them. And it's just not have been part of the, you know, training for those faculty or professional development for those faculty to be able to do that. So I think I wouldn't put, you know, all of it on the AP exam, but I'd put it more on the structure of how we believe we can assess statistical knowledge and how kind of non-dynamic that structure is, um, is that 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 does tend to, um, I think, um, you know, structure some of our teaching. And, and it's not that you can't assess any statistics course on pencil and paper. I think there are some you absolutely could, um, uh, perhaps something a little bit more theory driven where, you know, the assessment piece would in fact involve you writing out a proof like, Sure, you don't have to write it on a computer, you can write it on a piece of paper. But if we're trying to assess multivariable thinking, it, it is not trivial to do that on paper. It is doable, but I think it, it would still end up giving a limited view of things. Like it could be about how do you interpret these results in a multivariable scenario? And that sort of question can still be, you know, even if it's a multiple choice question, like can still be a really, really good question. But we've, if we, even if that was the entire test, I feel like students would still be missing the really valuable component of here is the data set. What do you do to begin with? You know, how do you get it into shape? How do you actually interact with the data? How do you visualize it? How do you, you know, filter it and mutate it and whatever? Like all of these things are, I think, are things these computational steps I think really help with the statistical thinking as well and if we're not letting our students interact with the data like work with the data on a computer we end up missing that important piece of I think statistical thinking and we end up giving them half of the story and not the other half. Yeah that uh that goes really well into sort of this uh some of the questions I had about you know what type of topics are appropriate for the more hands-on learning? And for me, hands-on means you have data, you have your computer, and you uh, <laughs> go to battle with it. And so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I guess maybe, uh, but, but before we go into that, um, may I guess here, here's like our little, a bit of a, um, so I th sort of think that these topics might be viewed in sort of like what, um, what should be taught versus like how, ought to things be taught. Um, is that is that a correct sort of division of this educational conversation? Or are there other facets that I've missed? So for example, like when you talk about the structure, um, and how we restructure these things, these seem like a how question, um, because yeah. you've already essentially agreed that it's a, a value that should be put in. But is that like the dividing line? Or are there other aspects? as well? Yeah, I think I think thinking is happening on both of those axes, like what should be taught, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think everyone agrees 100% on what that list is. And, and I think that's fine. I think that's what's exciting. Like, I think if we all agreed, then there would be very little innovation happening. So that's good. Mm -hmm. And then how do we teach it? So one of the things I said is, for example, that what should be taught is working with real data, like as in students actually not just hearing about a real data set, but be given a real data set and do stuff with it. And I suggested then we have to teach them some computing so they can actually work with it. I will admit that I think that's the easy way out. I mean, I think that's a great thing. If we can all achieve it, I would be happy. There's also folks who are doing, you know, some really interesting thinking about, can we teach this sort of computational thinking without a computer in hand? I don't know the answer to that question. It's a really difficult question. I don't, it hasn't necessarily been answered. Um, but I think it is an interesting question. So now we're saying, okay, maybe we agree that statistical and computational thinking are important things to teach. And one way of doing that is while well, bringing the computer into the equation. But is there a way of doing this without that as well? So I just feel like there's like work happening on both of those axes of what and how. 
um, that that is exciting. Um, I think that the other quadrant of well, since we won't be teaching computing, let's also not teach computational thinking as much. I think I'm hoping that that's more losing traction at this point of uh, you know, especially at the introductory level of statistics and data science education. Um, and I'll also mention, I think, you know, there's this notion that you can't teach data science without a computer, but you might be able to teach statistics without a computer. I feel like I hear that a little bit or see that uh, expressed in like how people structure their courses. Um, and I disagree with it. I mean, I, I, I'm really, really excited and have both worked on and benefited from curriculum development for like introductory data science courses. I find it to be a lot of fun. I find it to be something really engaging to work on and students respond well to it. And that's always nice. Um, but I don't think that means we should just innovate there and then leave our intro stat courses to be what they were. Uh, I think that a lot of what we're seeing there in what we're able to accomplish in intro data science courses um, needs to trickle down a little bit to the um, introductory statistics courses as well, because ultimately these are the same students. And if they are able to quote unquote, handle the computational complexity that's introduced to them in that course, they can handle it in the other course as well. There may be different, you know, focuses for these courses. If they're gonna be two separate courses, they should have two separate syllabi, sure. But I don't think this notion of like, data science is computational. Statistics doesn't have to be, especially at the intro level. I don't think it's the right way to approach um, things. Yeah, especially because um, I think many people actually find computational approaches to learning much more intuitive than analytical approaches to learning. Um, again, so it's sort of like, you know, you could do a pen and paper proof um, and have some type of analytical solution. But many people actually, I think, learn better, one, taking a computational route to an answer, um, which would then uh, potentially uh, motivate an analytical uh, solution yeah. later. So it's yeah. like, okay, I figured this out computationally, um, but I also realized that since it's computational, I have to edge cases and things like that. And therefore, I'd like the... An now they have sort of the motivation to go and pursue an analytical answer where they didn't previously, in addition to the fact that uh, by solving it computationally, they now have a very good intuition about the right track or how, how they would actually want to formulate that analytical problem. Um, in addition to the fact that I think people really just think differently. Like, so you might have some people who really appreciate that sort of analytical approach and there's other people who have a much easier time appreciating the computational approach. Um, I agree. Yeah, and just, um, it's actually one of the things that I'm trying to just, uh, as, a, as a quick side note, one of the things that I'm uh, trying to work on, and I, I have a friend who's working on a similar issue where um, we're uh, looking at trying to teach uh, certain uh, biomedical engineering and biomedical data science topics um, from a purely computational perspective. So it's effectively, it's a, um, it's a something of a niche field where Essentially, every student who's had to deal with this, they basically get sat in front of a Blackboard or a PowerPoint presentation, and they're just given the analytical solution. And it's just sort of like handed down from the sky um, by the geniuses who you will never be, you know, that that type of thing. And it's like, and then you wonder, it's like, well, why, of course, these students can't apply these principles to a real life problem um, because it does become a computational problem very quickly. And also, they just don't. Um, the analytical aspects are so complex that you're not going to get it on a once through. So they, they lack the intuition about how to actually be handling these and how to be applying these concepts in real life. So um, we have a bit of a hypothesis that if we provide students and we teach this from a different angle, from a computational angle, that there's some subset of the students who will actually really be able to um, thrive on this otherwise dip difficult topic. Um, so anyway, we'll experiment, see if it works. and. Um, it, with any luck, um, because it is an important field. I don't want to give away too much now because I'll be talking about it later. But um, I, I am hopeful that effectively we can start taking new approaches to learn how students learn, especially given that um, many expert researchers. I wonder if uh, not not to jump topics too much, but you know, I, I do wonder if like if a lot of uh, academic researchers, because they are typically the people who can thrive under sort of that more analytical environment, so the analytical solutions of problems, um, 
that effectively we are positively selecting towards that because they were able to thrive under the previous teaching paradigm. And that effectively would then, you know, um, you're going to be losing some effectively very good researchers who are computationally minded. Um, because, you know, obviously if they think that they can't cut in academics or they don't find, you know, that classwork sufficiently interesting to go on. Um, I don't have a huge amount of data other than just personal anecdote to base that off of, but, um, there obviously are, um, there are second and third order effects to teaching these ways. And some of them would tend to be, uh, self-reinforcing. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, so I think it is true that especially if we're thinking about like an academic statistics department, um, you know, there's a very long history of um, valuing very highly um, contributions to methodology that tend to be um, a little bit more theoretical work. Um, I think there is also a long history of more applied statisticians feeling like their value, their work isn't valued as highly as some of the theoretical work. And then what I can say for myself is, you know, or at least from my perspective, is there's also a long history of people who identify as their work uh, primarily sits in the education area, as their work being thought of as different you know, even if not secondary, just different than like methodology and theory work. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I think that, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're seeing some changes there. I'm, you know, not like saying everything has changed. It hasn't. Uh, but it is heartening to see, say more and more publications that focus on how do you work with data? Like, what do you do when you have a messy data set. What are some good practices for reproducible computing and stuff like that? And at least I'm getting some traction. Now, do they get some, as much traction as some of the more traditionally valued work? Maybe probably not. Do they get considered the same way with an academic structure when it comes to things like promotion and tenure? Like that, th those are all like very difficult questions to answer. But what I can say is that uh, while things aren't like perfect, nowhere near perfect, it has been heartening to see at least the area, the subset of the discipline that I'm most familiar with within the education area, more and more um, kind of faculty, uh, like junior faculty who are starting off and dedicating themselves to statistics and data science education to be focusing on um, development of computational tools for teaching of computing, for example, or focusing on uh, their courses on how to do better computing, how to um, do reproducible computing and stuff. And I think that lots of curricula are offering courses like that. Curriculum guidelines cherish courses like that. We are able to see how students who go through these sorts of courses, like computing courses, are then uh, expressing that they do well in their capstone or thesis projects where there is a theory and an applied component as well as the computing bit. So I think that feedback loop has been great. Um, I was recently working on like reading through our exit interviews from uh, Duke from last year in preparation for some faculty meetings. And, you know, it, students love our statistical computing course, for example. And like they really say they're like, we can't believe this is not required. And um, it is a newer course. You know, I think it's maybe like last five years or something, which is nice to see that um, they are able to see the importance of these as well because they're able to see when they apply for jobs that's the sort of skill that's being um needed so i am encouraged by computing being a formal part of statistics curricula i think we need to push it further and we also need to make sure that um faculty who are teaching it are their time is valued as well they're not just you know teaching things you can pick up in an afternoon like these are there's a lot of thought that goes into um kind of structuring that sort of curricula as well and um the thing that i hope to see more and more of is that i think that lots of educators and you know statistics faculty in general are on board with including like a course on it in the undergrad curriculum, including a course or two on it in the master's curriculum, but we don't see much of that in the PhD curriculum. I think we often think of our PhD students as, look, they've made it this far, they're clearly dedicated, 
let's teach them the important stuff, which is the theory, and they'll figure out the computing. And some do because they are incredibly motivated individuals. So that thing that you were saying of like, I wonder if there's like some selection bias because the faculty tend to be the people who have thrived. Well, the person who becomes a faculty member tends to be the person <laughs> who is okay, you know, working all night, trying to solve a problem. So our PhD students are there, have made it through the system because they're so good uh, and because they're self-motivated and sure they can pick things up on their own, but why not give them the benefit of, instead of having to wade through all of that on their own, a course or two, some formal instruction on the best practices so they're not wasting their some of their time wading through things that may not be beneficial, but also so they see it as equally crucial to their education as some of the other content that they're covering. Because I think soon as you put a course on any curriculum at any level as like a core course, you're labeling it important. And there is a messaging there that I hope to be able to see like more in the graduate curriculum as well. And at the undergraduate side, I think lots of good statistics programs now have a computing requirement or a strong recommendation. Um, there is a course that signals this. And I think what we are now seeing, maybe a little bit more slowly, but it's happening and I hope it continues to happen, is the kind of the downstream effects of that trickling through the rest of the curriculum. So I'll give a very simple example, but like we used to, we started teaching our introductory statistics course where students did, you know, their lab reports in R Markdown, you know, really simplistic stuff, but they were doing reproducible computing, or at least like learning about one of the pillars of it, obviously not everything, but just like one of the pillars of it. But then that trickled down to the second course and the third course, and now they're doing it in all of their courses. And at as the complexity level of the course increases, they're having to learn more about reproducibility because at some point you can't just do it in a single document. So they're having to think through that. So um, introducing these things at any place in the curriculum can have an effect if you let it. It can allow the other courses to change as well. Um, but faculty need to be willing to adopt their courses too. So I think we don't see change by just adding a single course to a curriculum. We see change by allowing that the ideas from that course, if we believe they're important to kind of penetrate throughout the curriculum as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, I definitely would like to return at some point later to uh, the issue that you brought up on the opportunity cost of academics working on the educational aspects of this, um, because I think that is something um, that is not considered. Um, in fact, opportunity costs are something that I think a lot of people really just ignore as a topic of uh, in their decision making pro process and also the way that they view other people's work. Um, and you should be viewing it through the lens of opportunity costs a lot of time. But um, it also did strike me as strange that when you said it was like, um, that the statistics versus uh, going back a little bit, you know, the issue of like statistics versus data science and how much computing you want to teach when the fact is like in industry, I think that a lot of the one of the big divisions about why people start calling data scientists something other than statisticians is because they did have computing requirements um, that a lot of traditionally trained statisticians didn't have. Um, so they sort of needed a word for it. Um, and I'm, I'm obviously, I'm not an expert on the etymology of the word data scientist. Um, you know, there's record, you know, people have used that term, I think back into the 1950s at some point. Um, but in the modern incarnation, especially when it comes to like some of these like FANG companies, uh, FANG being Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, uh, for example, a lot of the high tech companies, they really do need people to have like computing and engineering skills. Um, that certainly aren't part of traditional statistical learning, uh, statistical teaching and education, and maybe nor should they be, but that doesn't mean they're any less valuable. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure what the correct mix is, but the idea that, um, that these different, that the, this differentiation is trivial or non-existent, I think is something that a lot of uh, more traditional statisticians have, they've been a little bit allowed to ignore it. Like you can say, oh, uh, statistics is just data science or data science is just statistics. And it's like, uh, no, if, if the difference in the priorities of what you're working on changes, then I think you, I think the case should be on you if you want to keep using those terms for the same thing. It's like saying like weightlifting is just swimming because you're moving masses, you know, with the resistance. Um, but yeah, um, 
so yeah, I, I, I just want to give a quick bit on that where um, it does seem like for the job market, people are actively being selected for their ability to have computation. So given that that's going to be required, it does seem to me that um, there's not too many good reasons why you shouldn't try to maximize the computational experience. Um, and yeah, like I guess the, the quick throw message is like, yeah, if you don't have access to a computer, then and you need to continue learning, that's something. But the fact is, you know, computer science students have access to computers. You have, If you have access to a university, you generally have access to computers, isn't that the case? Or access to a computer lab. Um, anyway, I, I've been going yeah. on, but I, it's, yeah. it just, it seems to me that it's sort of like, that has to be such a, an edge case in the total experience of education, given the cost of it and everything that's involved, um, that a student lacking access to computation. I mean, you can even find it online now. You can have online, like you don't right. even need to stop uh, uh, right. get to get online, you need a computer, but. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that, you know, I don't think anyone is necessarily trying to, you know, generate statistics majors who are not interacting with computers at all. I think the, like the whole, like, not everyone has access type thing it tends to present itself more in the introductory curricula. And that tends to sometimes be driven by the size of those courses and the audiences they serve. They generally tend to serve more than just statistics majors, which tend to be not huge on campuses. Um, but people who need to take a stats course is a large number because it's an important topic. And that's a good thing that that's a large number. So I think that throughout the curriculum, at some point, yeah, you need to do computing comes into play. Um, but I think in the past, we used to say, and you could just kind of figure it out. And now we're saying more and we'll teach it to you. And this notion of, and now industry, and I think academia too, uh, values these skills highly. So can we teach you more? Should we teach you more technologies and stuff? And sometimes some uh, of us tend to think, oh, yeah, well then they can just like go double major in CS. But I think there's there's something to be said about teaching, you know, data science-y things under a statistics curriculum as well, whether that ends up being like a lot of universities do things like a certificate or a concentration or something like that to provide a pathway for students who prefer to go that route versus a different pathway for students who may want to, you know, concentrate their electives on something a bit more theoretical or mathematical. So it's nice to provide these pathways to students. And yeah, I don't necessarily think statistics is like the same thing as data science per se. Um, it's also not my like favorite topic to talk about, like what exactly it is. It's, but but it's there a are ratty, it's a ratty topic. Like yeah. it's just like there's it's there's almost nothing. Unfortunately, I'm going to be going and talking about this a little bit more. Not in this conversation, don't worry. But uh, some of these issues. But it it is sort of just a mucky. I, I'm not sure how fruitful it will be or if any good can come from it because people are opinionated. Anyway, sorry. I'll go go on with but, what you're saying. But I think there are interesting problems that a statistician's perspective would be so valuable that I don't think we can just leave that arena to be somebody else's and we don't anyway. But like one of the good examples that comes to mind is that like you mentioned some of these like companies with like huge amounts of data. Well, you know, they tend to do some, you know, things like A-B testing or whatever. Fine. Like that notion of comparing two groups is a very statistical thing to do. But then how do you do it if you have data not stored in a single file, not stored in a single server, like distributed across. Like, or what do you do in scenarios where this like true random assignment is not possible? That all of a sudden becomes both a computational problem, somewhere where you actually need to understand, perhaps even to the level of data engineering, um, but then also need to have the statistical perspective on it. And generally teams work on this, right? Not an individual works on it, but being able to thrive in a team like that means that I think part of your education should have touched on it or part of your on the job learning needs to touch on it one or the other. And so I think that if we're able to provide educational experiences to our majors who are you know, graduating with a degree in statistics, who also, can at least carry a conversation around topics like this, I think that is hugely valuable. And that means, you know, providing a pathway for them to be able to take courses like that, even if it might not be what one, what we would think traditional statistics, 
there are very real applications out there where we definitely would want to have someone with statistical expertise mm -hmm. um, in the room making decisions around them. Um, but you don't just get to work on those problems if you don't even have the right vocabulary, you know? Um, so we can't just say get in a team and you only bring the statistics and someone only brings the data engineering and somebody brings the software engineering and you work together. You need to have a common language to be able to work in a team like that, which I think means your education needs to touch on all of those a little bit. Yeah, you definitely need to be able to meet people part of the way because one thing that I've noticed, and I've been talking uh, to some other people about this, where when they're trying to communicate with other technical experts, so people who are very skilled in different technical fields, but not their own, that um, we're always trying to essentially create a connection from what the person's talking about to what we know. But the problem is that when you know too little about the other person's field, you impute too much of your own knowledge yeah. on that. And so effectively, some person could be talking to you and they'll give you a very clear idea of what's going on but you're so busy trying to fit it into your own limited um, alleyway or whatever uh, whatever metaphor you want to call it. It's like um, that you essentially, you're imputing, you're not really listening to them. You're just too busy imputing your own structure on what they're saying. And so then you start assuming what their conclusions are and what their, what their ideas are. And that's obviously not very helpful to collaboration. So you do need to go far enough yeah. to understand, to actually have that flexibility. Um, the intellectual flexibility. Um, yeah. Maybe just uh, just one more uh, thing on the on the academic bit because I think this is interesting. Um, are there certain topics? You know, you talked about the capstone projects and things like that. Um, are there certain topics that are better for the more hands on type learning, the hands on exercises, um, the more computational exercises? You know, even if you just notice that like certain things. Um, for me, I think, for example, statistical inference is at this point nearly impossible to remove from computation. Um, I don't know; someone can prove me wrong, but you know, I, I just sort of like by, by talking about like uh, parameter inference. Even if someone's doing something like uh, maximum likelihood or map estimation, things like that, you know, um, I think that the computational element, especially when there's non-analytical aspects to that computation. Um, you know, even some of our most basic models don't actually have an analytical solution um, that would then make the computation trivial. And some of the ones for which we do have analytical solutions, the computation is still so burdensome that you would actually take a computational approach anyway, so the analytical solution is no longer useful. But um, uh, yeah, sorry, to, the, the, my original question was, are there some topics that are better to learn with hands-on or computational exercises? Yeah, so I'll try to answer the question in a few different ways. So I think there are some topics um, that, you know, I, I also think that something like, um, like estimation, parameter estimation, or kind of testing that I think really nicely lend themselves to a computational first approach. So that's basically the approach we took, for example, in this um, new book that I worked on. Um, and it's not a very novel idea. I think people have been doing this for a while, this uh, simulation-based inference um, approach to kind of teaching inference. But I will say that I think that when introducing that prior to computation, actually physical hands-on works the best. So like, mm -hmm. like tactile simulation of first showing students, what do I mean by sampling over and over, you know? Um, like say, let's take bootstrapping in turn. I think that's like a really nice way of um, building some intuition around uncertainty quantification, like building intervals and stuff like that. But I think that to introduce that topic, um, prior to computation, bringing um, like hands-on simulation into the classroom mm -hmm. where you're like drawing things from a bag or something like that helps a lot because that allows students to see what you as the instructor might be imagining in your head when you say the words and we sample with a, with replacement over and over. Like if that's the first time somebody's hearing those words, I think it's really hard for them to understand what you're saying. So do the tactile simulation first, then translate that to computation. Um, and then what happens is if you do enough of these like simulation-based inference steps, well, what do you get? You constantly get that 
kind of shape that mm -hmm. ends up being unimodal and symmetric. And then that's a great leeway, I think, into saying that was an unhappenstance. Like this, people have thought about that shape and have come up with something called the central limit theorem. So now let's approach it again from a mathematical perspective as well. So we use the tactile to build grounding for the computing and the computing to build intuition for the theory. Um, another way I'll answer that question is actually there are, I think, some topics that re lend themselves really nicely to teaching computing as well, especially in the context of a statistics course. So I think when we think about, um, you know, CS 101 type courses, and I shouldn't make huge sweeping statements about CS 101 course because I haven't taken any, but I've seen enough curricula <laughs> at this point. Um, but um, they tend to, you know, approach teaching computing from a different perspective than I think we can approach in a statistics or a data science curriculum. Uh, one of the ways I really enjoy teaching, starting teaching computing to people who don't have any computing experience is actually doing data visualization. So use data visualization, building, you know, incrementally more complex visualizations to introduce students to ideas like what is a function? What is a data frame? What is a column? What is a variable? What does it mean to you know, have arguments in a function? What does it mean to build things in layers? Uh, what does it mean to debug things when they don't work? So like, I think that the, um, the seeing an image as a result can be very satisfying. Being able to talk about what the data is saying uh, based on that data visualization um, comes um, easily to people, perhaps too easily. They might end up making overarching statements based on what they see, but we can kind of like correct them along the way with that. But I think that's like a topic that lends itself to both teaching about data and thinking around data and teaching computing to students. And so I think curricula that start by, um, teaching statistics, data science, and some computing, but starting with data visualization tends to, you know, really grab students in. And some of that, like when it comes to practical implementation, some of the, you know, exercises you can give them, um, make this picture, you know, make this plot, like figure out how to make it, but we're telling you what the answer will be, actually is very similar in spirit to a more traditional computing course exercise, like, write a function that when you input X, it gives this number to you, right? So we're again telling students what the answer will be basically, and we're having them think through the process of building that. And I think that you know, that's a, like a nice way of kind of getting them in and getting them excited about learning about the computing. And so the learning about the syntax and the computing ends up being a nice side benefit of teaching data visualization. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point. And um, it's a lot more, it's actually, it's a it's a very flushed out uh, approach to some, uh, sort of a little bit of neuron that's been firing in my head, where um, basically I've um, been trying to help uh, a number of uh, software engineers uh, and people in the more um, well, the so sophomore, software oriented technical skill sets. Um, get their uh, foot in the door with data science and they're, you know, they're interested in machine learning and AI and data science and things like that. They've come to me asking, it's like, well, you know, well, what, where should I start? And one of the things I first suggested to them is like, start out with visualization. Um, so essentially just like go get Python, um, like essentially get, get some, get your Anaconda instance, uh, up and going, um, and just start, uh, plotting some data that's of interest to you. Um, and one, because first of all, these people have coding skills, uh, coding skills that would actually exceed mine, um, given that they're software engineers, for example. Um, and um, the reason that I said that was like, well, before one, it'll get you sort of viewing, having the data view of these things. So as opposed to viewing data as the output of a piece of software, for example, you're viewing it as the input to your data analysis. and um, so one, uh, I uh, instructed them to start looking at data, uh, plotting data. One, because also it's just helpful if they understand the data that their um, software is creating, you know, they're just one, they have an immediate way that they're already a better software engineer than they were before. But the other reason was um, because I told them, well, um, 
if you want to use like statistics and prediction and things like that, those are very formalized approaches to the data. So when you're doing a prediction, you're saying, here's a very formalized um, construction of how how the this data interacts. And um, that can become very rigid and has its own problems, which is why we have like robust inference and things like that. But uh, the reason that I brought that up was because saying, you can spend a lot of time trying to make these formalized decision algorithms and predictive algorithms work. But with the visualization, you don't need to go through that formalization process. You just look at it and you can let your brain more or less work and get come up with the right idea. So I thought that was helpful. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that, that there's, um, I, I appreciate that, that example that you brought up. Um, and one other thing that I found is that along this issue is that the more complex you make your visualization, it can be a very good segue to creating some of these more complex analyses. So for example, just say you can see a distribution or you have a bivariate distribution. Um, and maybe you want to highlight outliers or things like that. You know, you might create a, an anomaly function, uh, anomaly score, something like that, um, and start using that. Um, and you can immediately see how it interacts with your data. And I think that those things, one, they're very practical, uh, but also it helps bridge the gap that these things don't seem like they're being handed to you from out of the sky. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, you use basically you get handed this problem and you want to increment on it so you create a small solution and that amps up your skill. Is that, is that? Yeah, typical? yeah, I think so. I, I think so. I mean, I think this like notion of incrementally like doing things is like a very, you know, it, it's a good learning method. I think for anything you're working on, it lends itself nicely to computing related work. And I, I agree that like, I think, you know, humans generally have some intuition when they look at a data visualization. Now, this is not to in any way to say like you don't need t training on data visualization. I think I think lots of researchers who work on data visualization problems show that how humans can also misinterpret things either because of their lack of training on the part of understanding what the picture is showing, the graph is showing, mm -hmm. or also because of the choices the developer of the data visualization has made that can be misleading to the audience. So I don't think anyone is going to be like an expert in interpreting a data visualization on day one, but I think that, um, I think I think it would be fair to say that if on day one of learning about data, one option is you show a data visualization to a learner and the other option is you show a regression output, which one can they make more sense of without any additional training? I think hands down the data visualization. So. That's why I think it's like a really nice entry point to, uh, because all of a sudden you can write code to create something and you can have some intuition to figure out, did I create the right thing? Because you can kind of interpret what the output of that is. Um, an example I give, like a simple example with this often is, what if instead we learn, we taught students data wrangling first? You know, The first things I taught them is here's a data set create a new column, you know, based on the columns you have or filter it or something. How are they going to know they got it right? Like, it's mm -hmm. really hard to tell you got it right. If you made some mistake in your code, you could still get an output. Um, and I think it's really hard for you to gauge um, whether you got it right. I think on the data visualization side, things become a little bit easier for students to kind of gauge whether they're on the right track. Um, I've, you know, spoken about this topic a lot. And I gave like a series of talks called let them eat cake first uh, where the idea was like the cake is kind of like the visual that you um kind of make and like let's do that first before we um teach them more of the nitty-gritty of you know transforming data or modeling data and stuff and i i want to acknowledge one um kind of um constructive feedback i received on this is um well data visualization comes with its um you know, drawbacks when it comes to accessibility. So when we talk about things like you can all of a sudden see the output of what you're, you know, creating, um, that's not necessarily true if you are visually impaired, for example. So it does potentially leave, you know, a subset of your learners uh, behind if their either visual perception is slightly different or they're visually impaired. So it is not like a solution to all problems but i think it tends to be a solution that um that is well received 
by many learners. And I think importantly, especially when we're talking about like the type of learners that I work with, which are like university students in their first course, and they could do a lot of other things after that, right? They can choose to continue to learn more statistics or they can choose to be a music major. Like they could choose to do something entirely different. So we're thinking about both, how do we teach them best, but also how do we get their attention? How do we actually attract them to want to learn more? And so I think this notion of starting with data visualizations and giving them these quick wins um, tends to be something that um, pulls them in a bit more um, and is a bit more successful in getting them to stick around to want to learn more. So it has those like two benefits I've observed, at least for the type of folks that I tend to teach in a university setting. Cool. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Hey, folks, we're in the final stretch of our episode. So I'd just like to ask you if you haven't yet left a like or a comment to please do so. If you have already left a comment, consider leaving a second one. I'm thinking about doing a series of episodes on how things are calculated. It's like how things work, but on statistics and how things are calculated. Um, it's very original, I know. And the idea behind this is that we have a large number of metrics and figures that have uh, prominent roles in our lives, but it, we aren't actually really sure how they came around to those numbers in the first place. So I like to start a series on how we came around to some of these very common numbers that pop up in our life. So how things are calculated. Do you think that sounds like a cool series? If so, let me know. If not, let me know. Now, enjoy the rest of the episode. Maybe we should uh, jump to our other topic, uh, the one that, you know, originally I had in mind, but um, obviously, you know, it'd be, I, I don't want to have you on the show and not talk some about this education, uh, statistical and data science education, because, um, you know, it, that would be a true opportunity cost. Uh, that, that that would be a, a needless loss. But um, um, on the issue of open source education, uh, maybe first we should just start with um, the definition so everyone knows what we're talking about. Are the terms open source and open access education, can they be used interchangeably? Or are there important differences? Um, I, I don't think they're interchangeable. You know, I think open source tends to be about more the source code. So like, is that openly available and open access? Um, then is more, I think about, we can talk about licensing of that open source content to see like what level of access does that allow? We can think about how is it actually delivered to students and is it actually accessible? So I'll give a simplistic example here um, where let's say we're talking about an open source textbook in the sense that the source code is openly available. Maybe it lives on the web as a um, web book that's freely available. Um, so I think that's open access. Um, but is that web book really accessible to everybody? Um, generally, a web book means that you have constant access to the internet so that you can come back to it. Um, a PDF as, you know, that tends to be thought of as more archaic perhaps than uh, like a dynamic web book um, might mean that you can come back to it without access to internet as well. So I think you end up expanding your access level by being able to offer both. If you're able to then offer a print version, a free print version is a really difficult thing to achieve because there's like a physical material cost, but at least at a low cost. Um, now you've expanded your access level a bit more as well. So I think there are certain ways where open source and open access tend to go hand in hand, but I wouldn't necessarily say that they are interchangeable um, in terms of what the people who are accessing it to learn from it can get and how they can use it. Cool. Yeah, no, I think that is a um, that is a helpful um, helpful distinction. And uh, is there one that you I know because on your uh, on your website, your academic website, you use the term open source quite a bit, which I assume now, given your definition, means that you realize that there are still impediment there are potential impediments to access. Um, despite you know, frankly, I mean, some of those uh, of the textbooks you worked on, I believe some of them are available for like what thirty dollars or something like that. So you know, twenty. They're 20 all, yeah. I think we've settled out at twenty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So which it, which is an extreme reduction 
in um yeah. in the cost compared to um you know more traditional traditional textbook exchanges or college bookstores and things like that so um you know obviously you you've really reduced that barrier but um maybe just to hop into the the meat of things you know what is what are the biggest challenges to open source education what do you what do you think are the ways that this needs to be advanced I think there are, so there are a few, you know, as someone who's worked on this open source education project for now over 10 years. So we started this in graduate school. In fact, uh, my uh, kind of uh, partner in crime here and also friend, David Diaz, like he was kind of the idea behind this open intro project and him um, and Chris Barr had started it. And I kind of joined to like develop content first, but now it's been mostly uh, David and I leading the project. Um, So I can talk about a few things that are challenging. First of all, um, the content side, you know, I'm not going to say it's easy, but some of the success of open intro, I think, needs to be attributed to the um, what one might call the business side of things, I guess. And I don't mean business in like a profit sense, like it's a nonprofit, actually, the or the organization. But um, I mean, business sense in the a uh, sense of how do you then like get this out to people, right? Do you have a website that looks semi-professional that an educator from another corner of the world who may not know your name will come across and trust it that it's not just going to go away? So I think with open source, I think maybe products in general, but maybe less so in software than I feel like in educational resources, there's this um, feeling of can I trust it? Mm -hmm. Uh, which I find a little bit odd because I don't know why. um, I mean, I see where it comes from. But what I mean to say is I don't know why a for-profit publishing company is trustable versus an open source educational project isn't. Mm -hmm. Like, if you think about it, that company could just vanish as well. But I guess we tend to see big publisher names and say they've been around for a while. They're probably going to be around for another year as I teach. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't think that's a bad assumption, but I don't, I think that open source educational materials, lots of folks approach them with, what if the rug gets pulled under my feet, like in the middle Mm -hmm. of the semester and the textbook just disappears. And I I think that lots of people who work on the development side of open source educational resources have no intention of doing so. I mean, they've already decided they're gonna pretty much make no money from it, but are interested in doing it anyway. Um, So I think there's like that, trust issue that some of it can be mitigated by how you present the materials to both learners and educators and um, I have to give lots of credit to David on that and also Mina our kind of graphical designer who like has you know works on what people see when they first land on openintro.org and I think it's kind of like a marketing thing but I think it is helpful to be able to kind of get some of that trust. Another thing is outreach is difficult. You know, oftentimes with things like this, you don't have a, um, like a marketing department attached to you (laughs) that will reach out to people that will reach out to, you know, school districts and say like, will you use this um, textbook or something like that? So we do a lot of that, bootstrap that a lot ourselves. um, And so that, that can be lots of work. Um, And if you don't, you know, it could be just another open source book where, you know, in some faculty's websites, you'll come across this one PDF of a book they've LaTeX many years ago. But and when you read it, it's just fantastic, you know, but it's just that it sits there. And how would you ever know it was there if you didn't know about this person's body of work? So I think this like outreach is important for adoption. Um, otherwise, you might be an open source educational material creator who uses it yourself. And the only other people who use it are people who have heard about it from you or happen to stumble upon it. And that will end up inevitably being a smaller group than who you might be able to reach if you do a little bit more work on the outreach side. But those hours aren't free. So, you know, there's like time that gets sunk into that as well. Um, and then the other thing is the publishing side of things is, you know, um, non-trivial, right? So for example, we are able to offer the textbook, the paperback copy of the textbook at a low cost, and that should be indicative of how much does it cost to actually print a book. And in fact, it does have a little bit of a margin on that $20, about 4 or $5. 
um, that goes back to the nonprofit to open intro that gets used for things like we send free textbooks for, to uh, teachers who ask for a desk copy. Uh, we use some of that money also to be able to pay for the time of folks who will be doing things like teacher verification. So we have like this verified teacher system that they can get access to solution manuals and stuff, and that takes some time. So all of that goes back into the operational budget. Um, but if you don't send out desk copies, like it's hard for people to actually adopt your book. It's just a way things have been done and something people expect. Um, so like that price should be telling about um, how much it costs to actually print a book. I think if you talk to people who print, who uh, write textbooks, textbooks particularly, and work with publishers, you'll encounter a small subset of them who can also make a fortune off of it as well. But I think many of them actually, like many of the authors are not the ones that see the money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, it gets used in other ways. And um, like, that's just like the business operations of the publishers. But as you noted, there's a huge jump in price. And uh, to us, when we started this project, it was just like, especially for the introductory content that's not niche, it seems a little bit ridiculous to have a huge price tag on content that's otherwise covered in another textbook as well. Mm -hmm. um, and to justify that to your students. Um, something I will say on the positive side, I was uh, commenting about this with my husband, who's also a faculty member in my department. Lately, I've been seeing like in emails from the university, things like be conscious of the cost of the materials you require for your students. I think finally universities are thinking a bit more about equity issues. And I was just commenting like 10 years ago, that wasn't there. Like that wasn't one of the things that was in the emails from deans. And it's really, really nice to see that this messaging like um, top down as well, I think if you ask an individual faculty member, if there is a way that you can trust for your students to be able to learn equally well by spending less money on textbooks, would you prefer that? I think any faculty member would say yes. But that jump often requires some research on their part. And it's nice, I think, for these top-down messaging to change to alert faculty to think about that as well, because you know, it, it, a lot of faculty, I think, assign um, really expensive textbooks out of oversight. They never have to pay for it. So mm -hmm. they're like, well, I don't know. Students will figure it out. I haven't heard complaints, for example, is another thing. Students don't always complain about these things. They just choose to not buy the textbook, you know, and then learn less and then try to share with a friend or something like that, as opposed to complain about it uh, blatantly. So. I think there are lots of challenges for creating this material, disseminating this material, and especially if you're going to do it in print format as well. But on the other hand, it's been nice to see more moving, to, more people thinking about um, like access and equity, and then thinking of open source educational resources as one of the solutions to this huge and very messy problem. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, faculty members can just have PDFs, really informative PDFs on, you know, their website. And sometimes it can be full blown textbooks. I know, for example, uh, Gaussian Processes for Machine Learning by Rasmussen and Williams, obviously a machine learning classic. Um, and it's something where everyone has a hard copy, but also all the chapters are available online. Um, and there's a, a recent, recent is sort of in quotes, but, you know, um, um, some great, uh, 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 PGM uh, work, uh, probabilistic, probabilistic graphical models, and um, uh, uh, textbooks that have just come online and things like that. But I do know that from my own doctoral work, a lot of the learning that I did was not through textbooks, um, but was actually just uh, small monographs and things that people had everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering, you've written full-blown open source textbooks. Where does that fit in terms of the rest of this sort of open ecosystem. So I'm thinking about things like archive, Wikipedia, um, these other faculty, uh, smaller monographs and publications. Where do, where do these textbooks fit in within that ecosystem? Yeah, I think that, you know, the type of textbooks that you describe, like may perhaps 
things that students mostly tend to use at like advanced courses or in graduate studies um, that tend to be more monographs on a particular topic that is not like a survey of lots of like introductory topics, but like a particular topic and going deep. I think those sorts of things being available freely online has existed m for much longer than introductory textbooks, which is like a big business mm -hmm. with like a huge price tag on it. Um, and so I, I feel like the work that I've been working on fits on that side, like trying to build some um, kind of equitable approaches and innovative approaches at the op like the introductory part of the curriculum as opposed to the higher end of the curriculum. And, um, you know, there are textbooks, right? So we wrote, I have been involved with four of the textbooks, but we also have other textbooks. For example, we have an introductory biostatistics where um, two authors, Dave Harrington and Julie Vu, have kind of adopted the textbook that we wrote um, because the license allows for it by taking some of the existing content and then rewriting some of the others to make it a better fit for a biostatistics curriculum. And so there's both like there's also other open intro titled textbooks where I'm actually not an author. We just get acknowledged as, you know, this is based on previous work. And so I think that's like a really neat approach because the license allows for people to do that. So we're able to kind of reach bigger and bigger audiences. Uh, without just a small number of people writing more textbooks, because that's not really like a scalable approach to things. But the textbook alone isn't sufficient. So I talked a little bit about like teacher support and whatnot. But, you know, we also have an R package. We have computational labs. We have sample syllabi we distribute with it. So when if you're especially thinking about adoption by a larger, you know, group of educators, the sort of material that produ you're producing. And I feel like this is particularly true at the introductory level. Um, it is really helpful to be able to offer like a full slate of like, and here are the lecture slides that go with it. And here's a sample syllabus and here's a sample exam. Not because anyone's gonna use all of these things. I mean, lots of people are gonna prefer to create their own or make it their own, but it's helpful for them to see how could this textbook actually fit into a class that I teach as opposed to just taking the textbook and then building a whole class around it. Very experienced educators will have no problem with that. But, um, you know, people who might be like newer and generally into courses, you know, the, are one of the ones that get taught by like newer faculty, I think really appreciate being offered like the full slate. Hmm. Yeah, so it's really cool that uh... The idea that by virtue of these things being open source, that you can essentially proliferate around different application areas. Um, for example, you know, uh, you can take an introductory textbook and then someone can take it and make it. This one's for biostatistics. Maybe this one's for engineering and things like that. And by having an open source, effectively, you can allow people to put the correct spin on it to make it fit mm -hmm. for purpose. Um, and I've actually seen that um, there's a um, I'm not sure if you've heard of him, uh, Jose Portilla, who does a large number of Udemy courses. And effectively, mm -hmm. he has these modular Python and R introductory segments that he puts into all his courses. So effectively, um, you have that baseline value and just it's sort of it's like cut and paste value that everyone gets. Um, would it be on the issue of basically people adding on to these things, would it be naive to think that we could massively increase the number of open textbooks just by having more faculty members you know getting together creating like individual chapters individual monographs sort of um helping create the module modules from which we could then modularize uh these things but that is that is that naive or is that reasonable i wouldn't call it naive but i think it's harder than it sounds this mm -hmm. idea of um so I think this notion of modularity is something that comes up a lot as a solution to a lot of problems when we start thinking about scaling things up. And I think the reason, you know, it comes up in so many other contexts that obviously it must be, that, like there's some value in it. But when you then start thinking about modularizing content, it then I think becomes quite difficult to have like a single authorial tone in a body of book. That doesn't mean a single person wrote it, but just like this tone throughout. 
And learners really like being able to see that. They don't want to start reading a textbook where chapter one sounds like something and chapter two all of a sudden has a completely different approach to it. So I think modularization can work if somebody or some buddies will then be responsible of bringing things back together. And that's actually so much work that those bodies sometimes <laughs> are like, I'll just do from scratch myself, you know? So it's not easy. Um, so I think basically what I'm trying to say is that I think that's an approach that works if you have the right infrastructure to support it, but for it to be successful, it is more than just building like with Lego blocks. Like you, I want to, I think about it as, all right, I got my blocks, I built my house and now somebody needs to come back and look at it and restructure it, you know, with one vision um, to actually make it um, learnable from, and that is not an insignificant amount of work. The other thing is like this sort of development, um, I think would more open source things exist um, if we could carve out the time for them? That's probably true as well. Um, and so like, I don't know, sometimes it's a little bit hard to see like how that will factor into the things you're going to be evaluated on and stuff. Um, when, if, especially when it comes to faculty. Um, and that's not just about the textbook being open source, like it could be just any textbook project really, whether it's open source or not. But it is a huge undertaking to write uh, a textbook, you know? Um, so I think one of the things that I might say in terms of open source educational material development is that writing textbooks is hard, whether it's open source or not. I think everyone knows this. Uh, but I think it's possible for um, educators to have a contribution to the open source education ecosystem by contributing other things as well, you know, lesson plans, computing labs, interactive tutorials, things like that. So textbooks are not the end all be all, even though I think their impact is a little bit easier to calculate financially. Um, there are other very impactful projects out there um, that can have, um, you know, a good effect on both learners and educators, uh, both time and quality of the material they teach at a lower cost. Cool. Um, on the issue of those uh, sort of extra bits that go with your textbook, what is your favorite data set on the openintro.org? I've been looking through some of them myself, and I was curious, what is your what is, what is your expert opinion? What's what's your favorite data set or uh, data sets on that? Um. Okay, so there is one data set I, that we use to introduce um, multiple regression that is like from the Lending Club. I like that data set for teaching statistical modeling a lot because it is a, um, like students don't need to know a lot about how loans work, um, which is I think like for the level of the learner we're like teaching usually at the university level, they've probably not applied for a loan before, um, potentially uh, other than student loans, but like they can kind of reason around it. Mm -hmm. um, so I like it for that reason. And it is a nice, like a justifiably multivariable approach is what has to go with it. So that's why I like it. But I have to say, especially in the latest iteration of the textbook, We've used a lot of the data sets that were featured on the Tidy Tuesday project. And I think like that's a really nice resource people should be aware of as well for good data sets too. Excellent, cool. And our final question is, um, and this is a, uh, you're the first person I'm asked, but this will be a recurring question at the end of uh, new, uh, all new interviews. What topic would you like to see the statistics community debate? Um, what topic would I like to see them debate? I think maybe I'll, I'll give like a more, um, like a academic answer to it. Just like it's something like top of mind is like, how do we value the, um, how do we evaluate the contribution of educators in terms of like their contribution to both the discipline and also a department and stuff when it comes to evaluating them as people uh, when their contribution might be more on the education and learning of students and not necessarily on like published papers, for example. 
Cool. I think that's an excellent question. And I hope that at some point we can host that debate. Um, I do appreciate that uh, the work that you have done for the um, open source intellectual life of statistics and data science, I do recognize that comes at an opportunity cost because you could be publishing other work. Um, I'm glad to see that your work is, you know, being published in uh, education, uh, statistical education journals. But the fact is, these things come at an opportunity cost. And given your capabilities, you could be working on other things. Um, but I, I do appreciate that. But um, Mina, thanks so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey guys, it's Glenn. Thanks for your time today. I hope you liked today's episode. If you did, please consider smashing that like button. It's the single simplest, fastest way to make sure that YouTube shows this video to more people. If you really want to go crazy, consider subscribing or going to our website and joining the mail list. If you want to go totally crazy beyond that, forward this to a friend or colleague who you think might enjoy this too. We're a small channel and every bit helps. Our next episode will be coming out next week. So in the meantime, feel free to look around the channel and see other videos that might be of interest. As a quick disclaimer, the views expressed in the show do not represent anything other than the people saying those words, views, et cetera, like that. It doesn't mean anything about their employers or their employers' views or some thing about their employers or their neighbor's cat or anyone else not saying the words. And in fact, given that people tend to change their views when they're thoughtful enough, it might not even represent the views of the speaker by the time you're hearing the episode. So definitely come back and see if they've changed their views at a later date. They also don't represent the views of our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsors. You can check them out on our website. Thank you.